Well, you sort of heard a lot about my checkered past. And what I'm going to do tonight is tell you some of my favorite stories that I used in some of my books, and then this new project that I've undertaken, which is writing fiction for middle graders, but incorporating some of my own experiences and real ocean science into the story. But as I've been telling people, having written a lot of nonfiction, boy, is it fun when I get to make things up. <laughs> So as, as Dennis told you, I've had some great experiences, both as jobs and just as adventures uh, as a marine scientist. And here's just a couple. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of them. But I was the chief scientist for the world's only undersea research station, which is called Aquarius Reef Base off of Key Largo. There's a, a picture of myself. And you might recognize that person right there is Sylvia Earle. We were on a mission together and lived underwater for two weeks. I'm going to talk more about that. I did, in fact, work at SCA, where I spent six weeks on shore teaching my students. And then I'd go out to sea for six weeks with them, uh, teaching oceanography, real hands-on experience. Great, unless you are prone to seasickness. Not so good. <laughs> I'm very fortunate. I'm, luckily, I don't get that. Um, been, I did some work in Fiji, all throughout the Caribbean. And one of my favorite places in the world, where I'm going to talk a little bit about, is the Galapagos Islands. I was there in the 1980s studying the impact of El Nino on corals. And I spent about two months in the Galapagos. And I've been so fortunate uh, ever since. I have been going back with, OK, I will admit it. This is probably the best job ever. I am the science advisor for Celebrity Cruise Line's very small cruise ship in the Galapagos. See? So my job is to go to the Galapagos about three times a year to work on board the ship. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> um, I've also been very fortunate to go down in some small submersibles, a couple hundred feet. I'm either doing test dives or doing research, which is just fantastic. One of the things that I discovered while doing all of these adventures and in my jobs is that scientists who work in the field have fantastic stories. And they involve things like wonder and surprise and hard work. But the truth is, most people don't get to hear those stories. Typically, it's after a hard day of work in the field. We're all sort of you know, sitting around having a drink, soda, <laughs> and we share these stories. And so one of the first books I did was bringing those stories to the public in a book called Chasing Science at Sea, Racing Hurricanes, Stalking Sharks, and Living Under Sea with Ocean Experts. And it's really all about what the textbooks don't tell you about doing science in the field and the lessons we learned. And I went to a lot of my colleagues in all different disciplines, geology, biology, sub drivers, medical doctors, and collected stories from them. And here's just a few of my favorites. Some of you have seen some of these stories before. And I put a mix of new and older ones in. So some might be a refresher. Some are going to be brand new stories. In 1997, I was working with the US Geological Survey doing work in Florida Bay. And that's this wedge-shaped area, which is just south of the southern extent of the Everglades. And here are the Florida Keys. So it's this wedge-shaped area called Florida Bay. And a biologist said to me, there's been a bloom of sea urchins. Would you come out with us to look at the impact on the sea floor? And I said, oh, sure. And I thought, oh, one or two sea urchins. It would be sort of interesting, but no big deal. Well, let me show you what we found. Not just one or two sea urchins, echinoderms. There were hundreds of them climbing over one another. And this is what they were doing on the seafloor. Here's the seagrass. And it was like an army of lawnmowers marching through the seagrass, eating them away. And all that was left was sand and mud behind. It clearly, it was having a very Im big impact on the habitat in Florida Bay. We don't know how often they happen. We don't know why they happen. But clearly, a big impact. Now, I just want to say I'm going to show my age here. Any of you Star Trek fans? What does this remind you of? Dribbles, I know. <laughs> Another great story from my colleague Susan Humphreys up at Woods Hole. She is one of the world's experts in black smokers, or hydrothermal vents, where water comes into the, into the ocean through fractures in the deep sea floor. The water comes in, and when it hits the cold water, minerals precipitate out, and it looks like smoke. But it's really minerals precipitating out, and they're called black smokers. But when Susan was a graduate student, 
She wasn't involved with this at all, and her professor said, we have an opportunity to go down in the Alvin, this little submersal, to look at black smokers. Would you like to go? Graduate student, what a great opportunity. She says, sure, I'd love to go. And then her professor said, now, Susan, when you go down, remember that what you say during the dive, your voice is part of the scientific record. And so be very careful, because sometimes scientists see things, and they get very excited. And they say things that you don't necessarily want recorded. And so Susan said, oh, don't worry. I, you know, I've got this. She was a graduate. She was a student. She said, I've got this, no problem. Gets in the submersible, takes them hours to get to the seafloor. They get down there, and of course, what does she see? A black smoker like this, very active. But not only that, there are millions of shrimp swarming around it. And you can just imagine, oh my, and now I see the chimney with the shrimp swimming around. But the entire time, of course, she would wanted to say things like, oh my god, I can't. And she said, it's so funny. When you talk to her today, she, talk, she remembers that moment and how excited and inspired she was by that one dive. And as I said, now she is one of the world's experts in hydrothermal vents. And it really stems from that one dive. I don't know if I would have been as good at controlling my enthusiasm. Uh, coming back to the Galapagos. When you do field work and you plan for problems like weather, you know, you're going to have a couple weather days, almost always your boat is going to break down or some other mechanical failure. But in the Galapagos, I encountered an obstacle I never imagined. Everybody recognizes this creature, right, the giant tortoise. And how about this one? Blue-footed buoy, pretty easy. Those weren't so much of a problem. But it turned out the sea lions loved our equipment. Here's somebody I was working with, and you see a sea lion coming. They tried to steal our equipment all the time. Who would have thought this would be such a problem? We would put su survey gear on the bottom, and they would try and take it. I literally remember one day sitting there down on the bottom doing something in my dive gear. I looked over, and there's my buddy, and there was something pulling my fin. And, you know, it's one of these where you go, yeah. Well, and here's one of their favorite things. <laughs> they love to swim right up to you and get right here and blow bubbles in your face. <laughs> you know, and it's sort of the tease, like, we're really good here. You're very, you know, inept about working in the ocean. They do it all the time. And I'll, I will tell you a little trick. If you're ever someplace, you're snorkeling with sea lions, and you want to get them to play with you, the thing to do is you dive down, and you do somersaults and twists like they do, and often they will come and do it with you. I just spent, I was in the Galapagos about two weeks ago, and I must have spent an hour in the water with this one sea lion. And you know, I'd come up, I'm so tired, and then I'd, I have to go back down and do it again. Because it was, I, I don't care how old you are, but if you get in the water playing with sea lions, it is just fun. So here's just a few stories about working uh, at Aquarius Reef Base and living underwater. So the habitat is located 3.5 miles off the Florida Keys, off of Key Largo. And it sits in this sort of sandy horseshoe area inside Conch Reef. It's owned by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and it's now operated by FIU. And the whole idea about living underwater is it gives you time and access. If you're diving from the surface, say 100 feet. You might, if you're lucky, might have two dives at the most for 15 minutes. If you're living at 50 feet, you have six to nine hours a day down to 100 feet to do work. So you can imagine if you're doing surveys or collecting samples, that's a real advantage. So here's what it looks like. And let's see. The base is at about 65 feet of water. You're living in here. So you're really living in about 45 to 50 feet of water. It's about 43 feet long, 9 feet in diameter. It's a cylinder. Uh, missions tend to be one to two weeks long. And you have six people living inside, or six aquanauts. If you're in space, you're an astronaut. You're living underwater, you're an aquanaut. And you also have a shoreside support staff. So it's just like NASA and a, a mission control. You have to have about 10 to 12 people 24 hours a day monitoring what's going on underwater. On the surface, you have what we call the LSB, or life support buoy. And it's connected by cables down to the habitat. And on, in there, you have a compressor for air. You have a generator for power. You also have a communication system. So you can actually 
make phone calls, get on the internet, you have full communication while you're living underwater, which is very handy. And here's what it's like inside. So to get in, what you do is you get on your regular scuba gear, you dive down, and you swim under here, take off your tank, hang it up on a rack, and then you climb in through the moon pool. And this is one of my favorite parts. So just think about the fact that the air inside the habitat is kept at the exact same pressure as the water outside. So the water can't flow in. So you can have an open hatchway. And so basically, once you take your tank off, you just walk up this ladder, and you go from 50 feet down. You're in water. You, know, you could be standing there, fish swimming around your feet, and you're in air climbing up into the habitat. Inside, there are several different compartments. The main compartment, one whole side of it is really sort of system support, life support, communications. And of course, you have to have a duplicate of everything. In case something breaks, you want to make sure you have a duplicate. On the other side, you have a nice little, there's a nice little window. There's me many years ago. <laughs> There's our window, our little table for eating and working. And behind that is the bunk room. It's two tiers of three bunks. One of my colleagues, I, I think, I don't, I don't remember which one he actually slept on. One of my colleagues goes around saying who we were on the same mission. He loved to sing, I slept on top of Ellen. So I'm like, thank you so much, because we slept in the same bunk room. Um, and so this end right there is the kitchen. Everybody wants to know you eat when you're living underwater? There's the kitchen. And you can't have a stove or an open flame because you're under high pressure. And so you have an instant hot water maker, and most of you're eating camping food that you just rehydrate. But there's a little problem. For some reason, and nobody knows why, and even NASA scientists who have worked with us down there, your taste buds don't quite work. And everything tastes really bland. One time I mentioned that. And the next couple days later, we got a big package of hot sauce in the mail. <laughs> it was great. Um, but so things that um, normally you would taste, taste really good on the, on the surface, you just can't taste them. And so my favorite story with this is that one day, the wife of the husband of one of the guys I was saturated with sent down a lemon meringue pie. Sounds good, except what's meringue? egg white and air, so that was white slime under high pressure. And the lemon filling, you couldn't taste the lemon, so it was a white slime yellow goo pie. <laughs> yeah, we said no more of those. Um, the other thing that happens is because a lot of the gas that's in your system is nitrogen, think about what's nitrous oxide, laughing gas. And so things that are funny so on the surface, down there, belly rolling, tears coming out of your eyes, laughter. We watched during decompression. You have to go through 17 hours of decompression before you come to the surface. And you just do it inside. We watched one of the Austin Powers movies. We were laughing, almost crying. One of the scientists got in his bunk and used the bunk lights like he was Dr. Evil. And I came up to the surface and I watched. And I said, that was kind of funny, but not that funny. And that was the nitrogen narcosis. Um, it affects everybody a little bit differently. Kind of funny. Um, the other thing that we have, I don't know if they're still there, but while I was there, we had these wonderful neighbors, giant Goliath groupers. And in particular, they seemed to like one of the staff members. His nickname was Otter. And Otter would be out scrubbing valves, and the groupers would come and sidle up to him. And they started doing this all the time. And then they started becoming friendly with everybody. And so we had to have a new policy, no hugging the groupers. Because you don't want they have mucus on them that you don't want to rub off. But they would literally come up to you. And one time I was lying on a grating doing something, and one of these giant Goliath groupers came up to me, laid down, and opened its mouth. And I think it must have thought I was at I was a cleaning station where things go and pick, you know, particles off. And I was so because I could look right down his mouth. I was so tempted to put my hand in there and pick something off. But then all I thought about, what if I did that and it closed its mouth and I was stuck underwater with my hand in a giant grouper's mouth? Can you imagine? Somebody probably would have taken a picture and posted it, and that was it for my career. So I decided not to play cleaner. So that was that first book. Um, and after that, I was like, I was really enjoyed writing popular science and bringing stories to the public. And I was thinking about, what should I do next? And I became very intrigued with the idea of how we talk about the diversity of life in the sea, why it's important, and how can I engage a lot of people? 
And so I came up with this idea. The original title for the book was Weird and Wild Under the Sea, Why These Creatures Matter. But as I started doing the research for the book, several very intriguing themes came up. Turns out, more animals than I ever knew use mucus in some way, whether to defend against predators, to trap food, to travel over the bottom. There is a lot of slime under there. Also, to bring forth the next generation of animals, there's a lot of sort of, shall we say, interesting reproductive strategies. And finally, what folks here at Harbor Branch know so well and work on, there are more types of animals for coming from the ocean used in biomedical research, either as models or in the search for new pharmaceuticals than I ever knew. And so I went back to my publisher and I said, mm, how about a new title? Sex, Drugs, and Sea Slime, The Ocean's Oddest Creatures and Why They Matter. Now, the University of Chicago Press is fairly scholarly, so it took a little arm twisting. So just a couple stories. I know some of you have seen some of these before, but I also threw in some new ones. Uh, the first chapter in that book is called The Invisible Crown, and it's really about the microscopic organisms, the floating plants, the phytoplankton, and floating animals, zooplankton. And there are some very beautiful designs, as well as some monsters in miniature. And even in that group, there's slime. And here's a game. And I know there's a couple members in the audience who have played this game before. I see somebody sitting in the front, kind of in the front there. So you can't play, because that would be cheating. So I like to play this game with my audience. It's called Mystery Young, because many of the animals in the ocean's microscopic world are larvae of things that we would all recognize when they're adults. But when they're larvae, they're pretty hard to figure out what they are. So just a couple. I'm going to show you the larvae, and I want you to guess what the adult is. And if you've played this before with me, please, you know, no cheating. So what do you think? For those of you who haven't, what do you think? Here's the larvae of something that you would recognize when it gets old. A shark? A stingray? That's a good guess. A jellyfish, oh, that's another good guess. A, a, a crab, somebody got it, yes, very good. It's a crab, but obviously it goes through several changes as it develops. How about this one? This one's pretty tricky. What do you think? Octopus, no. <laughs> a turtle, good, oh, that turtle's a good guess. What do you think it is? A seahorse, that's a great guess, but guess what, ready? It's a sea star. Wow, I know, that's kind of that's kind of crazy. OK, here is another one of my favorite creatures, which most people don't ever get to see, that sort of, it's a little bit past the microscopic stage, because you can sort of see it. It's called a foraminifera. And they live, they're amoeba-like creatures, and they live in these little shells or tests of calcium carbonate. They kind of look like miniature golf balls. And they float around in the ocean. And they feed by taking their arms of goo outside the shell and, and collecting particles, bacteria, particles that float by. Some have spines to help them float. And in this picture of a live foraminifera, typically the only thing you see are the shells in the sand. But this is a really cool image of a live foraminifera. And look at those dots. Can anybody guess what those are? Food is a guess. What do you think? Maybe, uh, like, slime that is, like, bioluminescent? Wow, that's pretty clever. I might have to use that in one of my books. He said slime that is bioluminescent. You have a very good imagination. Ooh, eggs. That's another good one. But you're all wrong. <laughs> they're, they're algae cells. And what the foraminifera does is they take the algae from inside their shell in the morning put them out on the spines to photosynthesize and grow. And then right before dusk, they pull it back into the shell. That way, if there's not a lot of food, food floating by, they've got a little farm inside. Pretty clever for an animal that doesn't have a brain. Ah, now here's a new one, new one that I put in this slideshow just for all of you. The spiny lobster. We all think we know a lot about the spiny lobster, but they have some really interesting behaviors and capabilities. Have any of you ever seen this, the march of the spiny lobster? Turns out, after, say, maybe around the first storm in fall, when it's starting to get cold, spiny lobsters have a two to three week trek offshore into deeper water to protect themselves from the cold. And they do it in what's called a queue, 
which is really odd. See how they have sort of tail and they've got their antennas? It's, they, scientists think they do it in this sort of single file march because it's like bicycle riders. And the, the lobster behind the one in front of it is actually drafting. So it's more energy efficient. They also think that as the line, the sort of crustacean train marches offshore, it attracts more lobsters to join in. And they think that they navigate possibly by the Earth's magnetic field, and they might be able to chemically sense or smell where their home range is. So very, very cool to see that. And when you talk about smell, another really interesting property that there are some scientists have discovered is most of the time, if you're going out lobstering, you see something like this. You see one hole, and you see them all crowded in there with their spines waving around because they're, they're defending themselves against divers, hungry divers, sharks, eels. But it turns out juvenile spiny lobsters can actually sense, they smell, when another lobster is diseased. They did these experiments. And if another lobster is diseased, they basically shun them and make them go in a hole all by themselves. They basically put them in quarantine. And they think, the scientists think, that this is so that, that if it's an infectious disease, doesn't spread throughout the lobster population. Isn't that amazing? So they're not just good to eat. So I already mentioned cleaning stations. Uh, on coral reefs, there are specific places set up where fish and eels and other creatures basically go for a wash and shine. They basically can be a coral head like this, and a fish comes over, and they typically they may present themselves with their head down. They may flash a certain color, take a certain body position, and then shrimp and cleaner rafts will come in. Remember how I talked about I was tempted to do it with that big grouper? This is what they'll do. The, the fish will put its mouth open, and they will come, take off mucus bits, parasites, dead skin. But it's really funny because there is something called the saber-tooth blenny, who is a con artist and is colored very much like the cleaner wrasse. And so the fish will come in, and the saber-tooth blenny will be like, yeah, I'm ready to clean you. Come on in. Fish will set itself up. The saber-tooth blenny will go in, and instead of cleaning them, take a bite. So pretty clever. And I decide since these are some common jellyfish that we see here, any of you guys swimmers deal with jellyfish? Yeah. Uh, I'm a big swimmer in Biscayne Bay, and we have had a horrible moon jelly season. They have just been there all year. So here's some moon jellies. One of the things about the moon jellies is they have a fairly weak sting, and their bells are actually color covered with, what's my favorite thing? Slime, thank you very much. They're covered with slime, and then when things get trapped in it, they slide down into the tentacles which in the moon jelly are just around the edges. Um, they tend to have a weak sting, but I will tell you it's very individual. So like I don't get impacted. I, I'll get a little sting. It will go away for in a couple hours, but other people are very susceptible to a stronger sting. We also have, these are very common by docks. If you look on the bottom, have any of you seen these upside down jellies? Yes? Well, they are very sort of strange jellyfish that sit on their bell on the bottom. You can see them pulsing. What's kind of interesting also is if something is swimming over it that they want to either defend against or maybe capture, they can actually shoot out their stinging cells like launching little grenades. So if you're ever swimming and you see these on the bottom, you don't want to swim right over them because you can get little stings from them. And of course, I just took this image maybe two weeks ago in Miami. What's this? The Portuguese man of war. Now, I will go in the water if there are moon jellies, but I will not go in the water if there's a Portuguese man of war. And these are not true jellyfish. They're actually called siphonophores, and they're colonies of creatures that live together. And they have a very strong sting. So I would encourage you, if you see these floating around, do not go in the water. Basically, what I did in, in the Sex, Drugs, and Sea Slime book is at the back end of every chapter, there's a section on why they matter. And my whole message with that book was, no matter how big, small, or bizarre an animal is, they're important not only to the ocean ecosystem, but to human society as well. Whether it's through food, the economy, jobs, biomedical research, biotechnology. But of course, many of these animals are now at risk due to things like climate change, overfishing, um, 
invasive species, habitat loss. And so the whole idea is we need to understand why they are so important so that we can better protect them. So I had done a bunch of popular science books and some children's illustrated book. And I will tell you, the last time I was here, I had so much fun with the audience. And every time I'd bring up some creature that used mucus, I had everybody shouting out slime that really, from that lecture, I decided to do a new children's book called Sea Slime, It's Ooey Gooey and Under the Sea, and all about how animals in the ocean use mucus in different ways. I mean, it was really because I had so much fun with the audience, particularly here when I was talking about this. But you know, I go around and I've been giving talks about these books, and parents and educators and kids said to me, what about the middle graders? What about kids that are like 8 to 12 years old? These young books tend to be four to seven, and these are sort of high school and above, and so there's a group completely missing. And what I was told was there are a lot of really good books out there for these kids, but they don't have a lot of science in them and very little oceans. So I decided to do my homework to discover what do kids that age like to read, and, and really, why is it important? And so I will tell you, if you think about middle graders, that's a really important age. Not only is it an influential time in their lives, but I'll tell you, these kids have an impact on their parents, on their peers, and they are our future leaders in conservation, in science, in politics. And so we, it's very important that we focus on not, not only younger, but also the, these 8 to 12 years old. And so what, what do they like to read? And so I went to the bookstore and collected all sorts of books. I queried some of my colleagues' kids. And I see some, some age kids that might know. What, would you guys have some favorite books? Harry Potter. That's a pretty easy one, right? Harry Potter. And one of the series that these kids love that I fell in love with is called Percy Jackson. <laughs> and the author, Rick Rorden, what he does, for those of you who have never had the pleasure to read any of these books, is he combines adventure and really sarcastic humor with Greek mythology. And the kids go wild for Greek mythology now after reading these books. Incredibly funny. I loved them. And I thought, what if I could do something similar with the oceans and combine adventure and humor with oceans and sea creatures? And the truth is, from all of my adventures in ocean science, I already had the elements of a really good story. But I was missing a couple things. Some of that sarcasm a little bit of teenage angst or frustration, and of course, I needed a good villain. And so with all of that, put those together, and I came up with a new series, a fiction series, called Tristan Hunt and the Sea Guardians. The first book came out in May. It's called The Shark Whisperer. Right now, we have planned five books, and I have to say, I am having so much fun with these books. And the first book starts in Sarasota, they then go to the Florida Keys, and then the, the kids go on an adventure in the Bahamas. And every book, they're going to go someplace different and explore different places, different marine habitats, different creatures. And so what I thought I would do for you this evening is just read the very beginning of the book to give you a flavor of it. And then I'm going to go through some of the real science and real creatures and real habitats that are actually incorporated into the story. A sudden, unnatural hush fell over the crowd. All eyes were fixed on the pool below. It was the worst of their nightmares come to life. Just the thought of evil, unblinking eyes, blood, and hundreds of sharp teeth was enough to scare the pants off even the bravest of bystanders. A boy's fallen in, a young mother shouted, covering her daughter's eyes. Call 911, do something. He'll be eaten alive. The woman's daughter, who had been calm before, now tore from her mother's grasp. She ran from the scene screaming, her arms waving wildly. The girl dashed straight into the mob rushing toward her. People were running to the aquarium shark pool, a dark curiosity drawing them like flies to roadkill. The commotion even attracted the local seagulls. About 50 flocked to the site. Their loud, high-pitched squawking and a barrage of bird poop bombs added to the growing chaos. Now, remember how I said I put real-life experiences into the book? How many of you have been pooped on by a seagull? See, a lot of people. It's, by the way, it's supposed to be good luck if it happens to you. 
Tristan, Tristan, the boy's father called out. He squeezed his arm through the railing that ran around the pool. But even with his arm extended all the way through and his face mashed against the metal, he was still far from being able to reach his 12-year-old son. The sharks, they're coming, another man yelled, pointing to three large dorsal fins slicing through the water with deadly efficiency. They were headed straight for the boy. At first, young Tristan Hunt did not know what happened or where he was. One minute, he was leaning over the pool's railing to get a better look at the sharks swimming below. The next thing he knew, he was in the water. When he landed, it actually felt pretty good, a refreshing, cool splash to escape the scorching South Florida heat. Then suddenly, Tristan realized where he was and that he was not alone in the water. This was no neighborhood pool. He swam to the surrounding concrete wall. It was slick and smooth. There wasn't a ladder, steps, or anything to grab hold of. That's when he saw the first fin. Tall and lanky, Tristan Lins seemed to grow too fast for the rest of his body to keep up with. He was constantly tripping over the simplest of obstacles as well as his own feet. The kids at school made fun of him. At home, his older sister teased him relentlessly with names like the gangling green giant and Trippin' Tristan. But this was the king of all trips, the captain of slips, the champion of stumbles. Tristan had fallen into a pool of sharks. Now, it would be a very, very short story if Tristan was eaten by the sharks. So clearly, the main character is not eaten by the sharks. He gets pulled out, and he becomes obsessed with all things sharks. And as some of our children do, he drove his parents crazy with questions. What do sharks eat? Where do they go? What do they like? And it just so happens, the same day he falls into the shark pool, a mysterious invitation arrives at their house the same day in the mail to an ocean-themed summer camp in the Florida Keys. Perfect. So his parents send him to the Florida Keys, to Cranky Key, to the Florida Keys Sea Park for a summer camp. Now, how many of you have been in Florida Keys? Have you ever been to Cranky Key? No, I got to make it up. I'm having so much fun. And there is no Florida Key Sea Park, but if there were, if I could design a park, it would be a combination aquarium, uh, water theme park, and botanical garden. And so that's what it is. And it's great. In all the books, we're going to have maps. And so there are snorkeling streams. There's a wave pool. There's a water slide. There's a sea turtle pond. There's shark alley. And there's a rehab center. And so Tristan goes to the camp. And he meets some of the other new campers. And they start exploring the whole area. And one of the things they do is they go snorkeling in the stream. And they get to meet some cow nose stingrays and some parrotfish. And they start discovering that they weren't just invited to this camp for no reason. It turns out they, like all the other campers, have traces of the genes in their body that allowed animals to first adapt to the sea. And they each have special ocean powers. And while they're at camp, they start discovering what those powers are. And one of the places that this happens is the rehab center. And one of the things that the kids can do is they can communicate, certain kids can communicate with different animals. And so this rehab center is not like the rescue center you all might be used to with wildlife. For instance, let's see, there's a moray eel that you see here. There's a moray eel that has a little overeating problem and has to, it can't fit in his, his hiding holes anymore. So he's on a customized exercise and diet program. There's a scallop. And you can see in this scallop, if you look and see these little blue dots, those are its eyes, and scallops can have up to 100 eyes. But unfortunately for one little scallop, she's farsighted, and so she keeps running into the walls. There's a clownfish who has a sea anemone phobia, and so he's under family therapy, and his brother's trying to coax him into the sea anemone. And there is a, a six-armed octopus that helps the students learn about camouflage techniques. And one of, the, one of the kids discovers he can change the color of his skin like an octopus. And finally, there is Snaggletooth, a sand tiger shark that had a hook in its jaws. And the only way they could save him was to take out his jaws and teeth so they're giving him dentures. And the main character, Tristan, discovers that he can communicate with sharks. So at one point, then, he, he and his new friends are in the lagoon at camp practicing when, they, when some lemon sharks arrive. And they, tell, they ask Tristan if the camp will help because there's somebody in the Bahamas who is shark finning. And unfortunately, this is a, a real problem worldwide where 
tens of millions of sharks are killed every year just for their fins. And I imagine most of you have heard about this. And what I want to do is every book, I've incorporated real world issues. So in the first book, shark finning and blowing up coral reefs. Uh, the second book, it's all about marine pollution and overfishing. The third book is going to be about illegal collecting. So there's a theme in every book. But the sharks ask Tristan if the, the campers will help them. And, and what Tristan is soon to discover is not only are the, the kids have special powers at this camp, they're also asked to go on secret missions. They are secret undersea agents to investigate ocean problems and save marine life. It's fair. I would have liked to have done that myself. So they end up going to the Bahamas after a series of events. Some of the older, older campers are there investigating the shark finning and what's going on, and they get kidnapped. And so a series of events, Tristan and his new friends end up helping to go on a rescue mission and to outwit the bad guy, and they do this in the Exuma Bahamas. And as you heard, I at one point was the director of a small marine lab in the Bahamas on Lee Stocking Island, and that is the real island. There's my house. And here's another map, and this is, this is Great Exuma here. Lee Stocking Island is right there. And again, one of the fun parts about this is there were some certain things I needed, so I got to make up some new islands and put them in the map. So some of them are real, and there's just a few, a few new ones. While they're in the Bahamas, they get to see some really interesting animals and habitats. One of the things that happens is when they first get to the Bahamas, they're in there at night, and they're on a dock, and they look down, and all of a sudden, they start seeing these squiggly, glowing things coming up to the surface and releasing a shimmering cloud. And that sounds pretty fantastic, but that's exactly what happened to me once in the Florida Keys. I was out kind of checking out the water on a dock at night, which I couldn't help myself, and all of a sudden, there were these squiggly things glowing, coming up to the surface and releasing a glowing cloud. And I was like, what the heck is that? And I had to ask Edie Witter, who many of you may know, I said, what? And she told me they are these Bermuda fireworms that when they're spawning, that's what they do. They bioluminesce, and they glow at night, they come up to the surface, and they must release their eggs and sperm. Well, the other things that happens is once they do that, they're kind of on a nice little light show. And you can imagine all of a sudden, fish start coming in and eating them. And it's this great show at night. And so, of course, I had to incorporate that into the book. Another thing I put in there were stromatolites. How many of you have heard of stromatolites? Maybe, a, oh, quite a few, fantastic. Stromatolites are only forming in a couple places in the world today. And here's a diver for scale. They look like tall pillars. And if you didn't know what they are, you would think you were swimming through the, the ruins of an ancient stone temple. That's really what they look like. And they form under very special conditions, and they're kind of like a layer cake of microbes and sand. And so what happens is you have microbes sort of creating a sticky mat on the bottom, and then sand washes over them and gets stuck. And then the microbes grow through the sand, and then more sand gets over them, and you get a layer of microbes and sand growing up like this, and it gets hardened over time. And they're really unusual looking. And so, of course, I have the teens in the book exploring some stromatolites. The other interesting thing about stromatolites is that we have fossil stromatolites that are billions of years old that we think are some of the first evidence of life on Earth. And then the other thing they experience in the Bahamas, which is probably my favorite, are ooids. How many of you have heard of ooids before? Not many. Oh, <laughs> a couple, a couple. So let's hear everybody say that word. Ooid. Any idea what a rock made of ooids is? An oolite. And in fact, under Miami, the rock that's under a lot of Miami is the Miami oolite. And right now, ooids only form in the Bahamas and Persian Gulf. They are, this is under a microscope, they're sand grains that look very much like round beads. And I have some, I think I have them with me. I have some with me, I think, to show you if you want to look at them. And they actually create these sand waves in the Bahamas. This is underwater, and they, they actually look like flowing waves moving with the currents. And if you're ever flying over the Bahamas and you look down, often you will see these white sort of wiggly stripes, wavy stripes, and those are sand waves made of ooids. And they form by having a nucleus of like a shell or some little piece of something. They get picked up in the water column, and then you get calcium carbonate crystals like limestone that basically precipitates around that nucleus, and then they, they fall back down. They get picked up again. You get another layer of crystals. They fall back down. And over time, 
you get these bead-like grains. Now, of course, I took a little artistic license in the book and used the sand waves like quicksand. So the teens, let's say, use it to outwit somebody on a jet ski. <laughs> so it's like quicksand, but it's not really like quicksand. It's, you could jump into it and they're about knee deep. A funny story about ooids is when I was working at SAA, I was doing some experiments at MIT on the dynamics of sand, and I wanted to collect ooids, and I brought with me all these bags and containers, because I was going to go out, we were in the Bahamas, and I was going to collect ooids. And my students, my undergraduate students, were like, she is really crazy. She's going to, you know, got all these bags and containers, she's going to collect, it's just sand. I'm like, no, you don't understand. They're ooids, they're really cool. They thought I was the most geeky, nerdy scientist they'd ever met. We get out there on a zodiac, we get out there, we jump into the sand, you know, everybody sinks in, and they start, and all of a sudden I hear, do you, do you have any more bags? Can we take some of these home? So they became Uwid fanatics as well. Of course, in the books, I get to incorporate some of my other favorite animals. Uh, they get to play a role, and one of the things I like is that the animals team up with the, with the teens when they're fighting the bad guys. They're not working against each other. I've got a great scene where birds, let's just say they bomb a yacht. Very handy. We have a jumping eagle ray. We have a, a lock picking escape artist octopus. So I really had fun with the creatures. Oh, and, and we have some recon hermit crabs that go on recon on a boat. Really was fun for me to incorporate sort of some of these abilities. And I will say, I love writing books of all types, but the notes that I get from readers and parents from this first book in the series have been the most rewarding of anything I've done. And here's, here's two. This one says, Dear Dr. Prager, my name is Nicholas Challenger. Is it okay for me to play Tristan Hunt in the movie? My other favorite books are Harry Potter and I have a fish to play a fish. How cute is that? <laughs> and then here's a book, that, a, a picture a mother sent me her daughter left on her pillow in the morning the book and a note that said, read this now, wow. Aww. So I've been getting really wonderful notes from kids and from parents, which I, that's one of my favorite things. And so this book, I have some copies here with me if you're interested. It's also, you can get it on Amazon. You can order it through bookstores. A lot of bookstores have it. I also have a website, which I mentioned in the back of the book, where I've got links to like shark tracking. There's a crossword puzzle. I put images of sea creatures up there. I have a little blog that I'm doing. And a little sneak peek at book number two, which is coming out in May. I just handed in the final edits, which is so it's like giving up your baby. It's very hard to give up the book. So I, we just finished the final edits. It comes out in May. And the premise of the second book is there are some mysterious fish kills in the British Virgin Islands. There's a beautiful picture of the area where it sort of takes place. And my favorite creature in this book, anybody know what that is? It's called a mantis shrimp. They have the most powerful strike in the animal kingdom. They have a second leg that is either shaped like a club or like a spear, and incredibly powerful sort of strike, and um, they even actually create a cavitation bubble. And in the book, there's a mantis shrimp little, with a little bit of an anger management issue. And he's been destroying the coral reef neighborhood he lives in, and so they have to have an undersea intervention. And he ends up playing a, an important role in the book later on. So I just want to thank Harbor Branch for inviting me. It's, oh, I always love coming um, and learning about what's, what's going on here. As well as my publisher, I'm now a fellow at the Safina Center, and my fellowship pays a lot of, for my time when I do things like this. And I've gotten a few grants from a few people because I'm sort of doing something that's a little bit unusual for scientists, so there's, your typical sources of funding aren't necessarily out there. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs>